Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the Great Controversy. Now, if you have been an Adventist for much of your life, you know this is a big deal for Adventists. But a lot of other people aren't quite sure what the Great Controversy is all about. This particular lesson, lesson number nine for June 1 of 2024, should help us. It's called the foundation of God's government. And we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we seek to understand you better and your government and how you run the universe. Help us to understand this issue about the foundation of that government so that we might be better in tune and better in line with that foundation is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. So what is God's government based on? What is its foundation? Jim? From the Bible study guide. The aim of this lesson is to show the link between the sanctuary, God's law, and the Sabbath, and the coming crisis over the mark of the beast. We also will explore the relevance of the Sabbath in an end time generation. Okay. To an end time, sorry, excuse me. To Jennifer, you want to jump in there? Sure, from the Bible study guide. Through intensive Bible study, Adventists came to understand the significance of the law in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Looking into the heart of God's law, they also discovered the significance of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. In fact, this commandment, more than any other, clearly identifies God as our creator, the foundation of all true worship, a theme that will be especially relevant in the final days of Earth's history. Okay, so one of the things you're going to help me understand as we read through this lesson, as we work our way through the lesson, why is that particularly relevant in the final days? And that, of course, would be based on Revelation 14, 6 to 12, huh? Satan's aim from the beginning, the, we, the beginning that we know about, we don't know how far back his, his history went, has been to thwart the worship of God through undermining the law of God. He knows that to offend in one point means to be guilty of all, according to James 2.10. So he encourages people to transgress God's law. Satan hates the Sabbath because it reminds people of the Creator and how he is to be worshipped. That should be obvious, I think. Mm -hmm. But it is also enshrined in God's law in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Because the law is what defines sin, as long as people seek to be faithful to God, then his law must continue to be valid, including the Sabbath commandment. So what are Satan's accusations? And it would be wonderful if we had an hour or two to stop and look at the handout that's available on our website entitled Satan Before and Soon After His Fall. And it's amazing how many diff different accusations he made against God. Everything you could possibly imagine, I think. Uh, Charles? The bi biblical themes of the great controversy and of the heavenly sanctuary are inseparably interwoven with the theme of God's love and of his Sabbath, which is included in his law. In fact, the great controversy started with Lucifer's erroneous accusations against God's character, his law, and the principles of his government. The rebel angel proposed that we are autonomous beings, fully capable of defining the meaning of life on our own terms and shaping our relationships with and the society in the way we want. We, we need to be gods ourselves, right? Yes. Yes, ultimately, this blasphemous proposition constitutes the clear desire to exclude God from our lives, from our relationships, and even from the universe. For this reason, our, instance, our insistence upon the validity of the law of God is not a matter of legalism or salvation by works, but Inasmuch as God's law is the expression of his character, the law stands as the core of the great controversy itself. Yes. Uh, defending God's law is defending God's character. 
and his status as creator and rightful king of the universe enthroned in his heavenly sanctuary. And you remember a few lessons back, we talked about three main roles that, that God has. Creator, Savior, King. And how each one of those impacts us, whether we like it or not. Upholding God's law means that we understand that God is the only source of moral standards and of the meaning of life. Abandoning God and his principles of life will lead to chaos and to eternal death. For this reason, Seventh-day Adventists proclaim the following Bible truths. The immutability of God's law. What does immutability mean? All you... Can't be changed. Can't be changed, that's right. It's like gravity. Yeah. The Sabbath, the second, the Sabbath is a sign of God's creatorship and kingship. So why do we worship once every seven days? Because we recognize that that is a memorial of creation, right? The heavenly sanctuary as a seat of God's government and of salvation in the universe and the Adventist movement as a remnant church called to proclaim God's last invitation to humanity to return to his kingdom. The centerpiece of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. These messages indicate that the great controversy is a choice between two diametrically opposed principles. The devil's, which leads to perdition, and God's, which leads to life. And we need to say as often as we can that Satan's government is based on what? Selfishness. God's government is based on love. So you want to know which way to go? Okay. Before, before the conversion of Paul, um, when it came to the law, he was perfect. Mm. The only thing that was different in him at the conversion to me, I believe, and I think all of us will agree, is how he looked at his creator. Yes, and, and yeah. His understanding of the creator. So Which caused, could, caused him to do a complete relook of the old, absolutely nothing the whole, changed the whole Bible. Life. Yeah. Nothing changed in his life, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Satan has done all. I'm sorry, Satan has done and will do everything they can to prevent us from worshiping God in the right way. We need to understand his aims and his methods. So let's think about that for just a moment. If you're fighting a massive war, the great controversy we call it, or other names as well, the crisis, various kinds, um, it's important that you know what the opposition is trying to do, right? If you know his, his things, his information, you understand how he operates, then you have a huge leg up on trying to fight against him. So Ellen White said, Gordon? So long as we are ignorant of their, that is the devil and his associates, of their wiles, they have almost inconceivable advantage Many give heed to their suggestions while they suppose themselves to be following the dictates of their own wisdom. This is why, as we approach the close of time, when Satan is to work with greatest power to deceive and destroy, he spreads everywhere the belief that he does not exist. So, Emphasizing again, the belief that he does not exist is spread by Satan. I have to stop and tell you my story. You've heard this before, but maybe some of our listeners haven't. I was leading a group through the Bible, discussing the Bible chapter, book by book. And this was in a, a home of a, of a non-Adventist couple, and they were all excited about this study and so forth. And this lady, who was a sort of in charge of it, um, invited a, actually the principal, the president of a seminary of a different Christian denomination to come and join us. That sounded like a good idea, right? And so we were talking about the great controversy and the devil and so forth like this. And all of a sudden, he just couldn't contain himself anymore. He says, why are we talking like this? We know very well that the devil doesn't exist. And, and he was the head of a seminary. He was the head of a seminary. But he knew where his paycheck came from. And that was very <laughs> important. <laughs> well, 
where he got that notion and why he got that notion, of course, along with a whole lot of other people, but what's Satan, what Ellen White says right here, what's, what's his main task? Convince people that he doesn't exist. I think you would agree, at least my uh, association with non-Adventists, no one has an idea of the great controversy. No one. No. They, um, they can't imagine that it has anything to do with the character of the Creator. Right. No. I mean, it just is foreign language. They have no hooks to, in their background to, to hang that yeah, concept yeah. on. Questioning God? Could you question God's character? Who could possibly question God's character? Some believe that no one could, and yet Lucifer did in God's very presence in heaven. Yeah, amazing. Well, they have, most religions have no concept of tr what truth is or freedom. And if you don't understand truth and freedom, you can't understand love. Mm -hmm. And if you can't understand love, you can't understand God. Mm -hmm. And no, no, no religions are concerned with those elements. It's just do, the, do it as you're told, knuckle under, God demands this. I listened to Dennis Prager a few, a few weeks ago. Oh, God demands. Well, that's when you say the word command. Sounds like that's command. God doesn't command anything. He gives you a prescription of how to live it. Mm -hmm. And then the most important uh, command, we call command, is a listening, to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Mark 1? 1229, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, mm -hmm. listen. Yeah, that's the that first. Pose, no, no imposition on it if you choose not to. It's yeah. a prescription for living. I know how prescriptions work. About eight years ago, nine years ago, I do the doctor gave me a prescription for uh, high blood pressure medication. I tossed it on the deck at, at the kitchen and uh, Eight or nine months later, I had a widow maker. So I know how prescriptions work. I chose not to fill it, and uh, the, it, the widow maker is a heart attack. That you usually don't care. It makes it makes yeah. a widow out of your wife. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then well, nine days later, a stroke. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so okay. I, I I know how you how how close you can get and come back and talk about it later. Okay, Gordon, you want to continue? So, Again, <coughs> Satan, when Satan is to work with greatest power to deceive and destroy, he spreads everywhere the belief that he does not exist, to repeat. It is his policy to conceal himself in his manner of working. There is nothing that the great deceiver fears so much as that we shall become acquainted with his devices. Aha! Uh -huh. mm. Ellen White, The Great Controversy, 516. Very important point. Okay, Myra, you want to try the next one? Sure. This is from The Great Controversy also. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the Creator as an object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolatrous, idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. Incredible. Hmm. The keeping of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to the true God, him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. It follows that the message which commands men to worship God, to keep his commandments, will especially call upon them to keep the fourth commandment. You can say, listen to his prescription. Yeah. Okay? God commands if nobody. You want, if you want to live, practice the, what you got to do to be alive, stay you alive. Can't, you can't have freedom if there's a, somebody demanding such and such an action. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Try it on your wife sometime, or your <laughs> wife will try it on your husband. Over time, if you, you, you... It works very well. <laughs> Not. <laughs> the p position that it is of no consequence, this is on White again, <clears throat> the position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. So you, don't, you don't need to believe he exists. He knows that the truth received and the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, another gospel from great well, conifers. How much, the majority of the money spent by people that is not for food and housing 
a good high percentage is for amusement or entertainment, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. what you're uh, what we're reading yeah. there. Okay. okay. If, if people are, and is there any serious thinking going on when you're when you're engaging in that kind of stuff? No. They don't want to be engaged no. in serious thinking. It's an escape. <laughs> but then, then that doesn't satisfy them. That I guess to get into drugs or whatever. I've never tried it. Okay. Now, question: Do Seventh Day Adventists faithfully and universally keep the Sabbath today? It's a loaded question. Yeah. Uh, well, how? The, 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 wait, but if it's not, so why do you call yourself Seventh Day Adventist? Good question. What does keep the Sabbath mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you call the Sabbath a delight, um, I'll tell you, after going to, through 16 years of Adventist education, I landed in a Catholic medical school. And that's when Sabbath was a delight for the first time in my life. Yeah. Under so much pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much pressure. Yes, Sabbath is a delight. It has to be. It's very interesting what comes next here. Once Adventists got the idea from Revelation eleven nineteen, which we'll read in just a moment, that the Ark of the Covenant, or Covenant Box, as sometimes called, was located in heaven, that, that the law inside that Ark was still there, written on tablets, uh, tables of stone, they began to see the importance of or other passages such as the following. And here's our, here's our passage, Jim. God's temple in heaven was opened, and the covenant box was seen there. Then there were false, excuse me, there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. Now, Bible says. if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, there's a lot of lightning, thunder, peals of you know, earthquakes, and so forth. Why is that? And when do those things happen? Do you remember? every time God is about to do something significant. And of Revelation eleven nineteen is just, it's the last verse in chapter 11. And what happens in chapter 12? The great the controversy. Story, the coming of the Lord. The story of the great controversy right there. And with Elijah and the cave, yeah. God was not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. Mm-hmm. Still small voice. Right? Small boy, right. Listen. It's no command, nothing to scare the daylights out of you. Okay. A verse for Jennifer and a verse for, well, two verses for Jennifer and one for Charles. Okay, from Exodus 25, verse 16. Then put in the box the two stone tablets that I will give you, on which the commandments are written, from the Good News Bible. And then Exodus 31, verse 18. When God had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets on which God himself had written the commandments mm. in the Good News Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, the dragon was furious, I like that word, with the woman, the church, and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all who, those who obey the, God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Wow. Yes. When the early Adventists began to recognize the importance of the law, they went back to study details about such things as the Day of Atonement. Okay. From the Bible study guide, the Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. All of Israel was commanded to take part in this event by repentance, soul searching, and refraining from all work as described in Leviticus 23, 29 to 31, which we'll read later. On this day alone, the high priest would enter the most high place to make atonement for sin. There, in the innermost apartment of the sanctuary, was the Ark of the Covenant, or the covenant box, as some versions have it. Within the Ark was, the, was God's Ten Commandment law, written on tables of stone, the golden cover of the ark was called the mercy seat, where blood was sprinkled to cleanse the sanctuary from sin. Obviously, figuratively, not yes. literally. Yeah. God's presence was manifest in Shekinah glory above the mercy seat. Mm. Bible study guide for Sunday. You wonder how many of the children of Israel understood something about what's going, what was going on there, because none of them saw it. I don't know who put those tablets inside that Ark of the Covenant the first time, I guess, when it was first made, I presume. Aaron or Moses? It must have been Aaron or Moses. 
Moses brought him yeah. down. And he broke it. He, he, he threw it down. Got the second one. I remember, I remember one time seeing a cartoon that has a, some very significant implications, but it was a cartoon, show, showing Moses and Joshua coming down uh, the, the mountain. And of course, you, in the distance, you can see the children dancing and carrying on around the golden calf. And Moses has this ga a ghastly look on his face, and he just drops the tablets, and they all break up in pieces. And Joshua says, you break all ten of the commandments at once, and all you can say is, oops. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, just pretty significant question. Okay. Okay, Leviticus 23, 29 to 31. Anyone who eats anything on that day will no longer be considered one of God's people. Wow. What does that mean? Yeah. This is on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. Once a year. You have to prepare for two, three days right. very carefully, and then on that day you eat nothing. Okay? And if anyone does any work on that day, the Lord himself will put him to death. Wow. This regulation applies to all your descendants, no matter where they live. Good news, Bible. Okay, we all hope to be counted among the descendants of Abraham, huh? Boy, that's pretty scary. Ellen White, in her book, The Great Controversy, added this comment. Within the Holy of Holies, that would be that most holy place, and inside there, inside the Ark of the Covenant, in the sanctuary in heaven, the divine law is sacredly enshrined. The law that was spoken to by God himself amid the thunders of Sinai and written with his own finger on the tablets, on the tables of stone. And where are those tablets right now? The one, it has not been found. It will probably not been found. Be found. Ellen White leaves us just a hint. She says, as Jerusalem was being surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar, and he realized that the temple is about to be destroyed. He and some friends hid. Jeremiah and some friends. Did I say Jeremiah? Nebuchadnezzar. I didn't, didn't think you said. Okay, Jeremiah and friends. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, right, right. Jeremiah and some of his friends hid the ark. And the question is, now if we're talking about the Ten Commandments being in the ark in heaven, is that the heavenly ark, and not the earthly one? And the earth one's still here somewhere. Or did God take things from the earthy ark after it was hidden somewhere to heaven? No, we, I think we know because is it Exodus 25 verse 8? This was a little kid, you know, we mm -hmm. memorized this. Let they make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This mm -hmm. art after the pattern of the one that I've shown you, Moses. So yeah. We know it's there. Yeah. Uh, the question is, is that the same ones that he wrote on his finger, did he take them up to heaven? Or is there a, a copy of it, a different, a, a separate a heavenly copy of which this, it, I mean, the heavenly original of which this is the copy? That's how I understand, that let him do exactly how it is there. Yeah. So that's what was made down here. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a question which we're not going to answer right now, but I'll let you think about it. Does this mean that this heavenly sanctuary the law in the heavenly sanctuary is written in Hebrew, and we all have to learn Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> Arabic and Hebrew. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead. Myra, I think you were... Uh, well, okay. Where was I? Were you the law of God? Did you? No. I think it was Jen. Oh. Hmm? I'll pick it up. The law of God in the sanctuary in heaven is the great original of which the precepts inscribed upon the tables of stone and recorded by Moses in the Pentateuch were an unerring transcript. Okay, so that sounds like there's an original up there somewhere. Those who arrived at an understanding of this important point were thus led to see the sacred, unchanging character of the divine law. So um, if you want to change God's law, you got to go to heaven to change it, right? <laughs> okay, Jim? And this is the subject which Satan seeks to accomplish. There is nothing that he is, uh, desires more than to destroy confidence in God and in his word. Satan stands at the head of the great army, army of doubters. 
and he works to the utmost to, of his power to beguile souls into his ranks. It is becoming fashionable to doubt. There is a large class by whom the word of God is looked upon with distrust for the same reason as was the author, because it reproves and condemns sin. Oh dear. We wouldn't want to have anybody condemning our sins, would we? <laughs> Great controversy, Ellen White again. And then our Bible study guide, Jennifer. As the early Adventist believers studied the Bible's teaching on the sanctuary, they realized the significance of the law of God and the Sabbath in the heart of God's law. They reasoned that if the law of God was pictured in the Ark of the Covenant in the heavenly sanctuary, it certainly could not have been done away with at the cross. Yeah. Think about the Sabbath, which at 1,000 miles an hour comes to us every week without <laughs> exception. What should that tell us about the importance of the doctrine of creation? What other doctrine has such a powerful and reoccurring reminder? Okay, so when we say it comes a thousand miles an hour, what are we, what are we talking about? That's the rotation of the earth. That's how fast the, root, the earth rotates. Matthew 5, 17 and 18, which we'll look at in just a moment, reminds us that even Jesus told us about the perpetuity of God's law. Charles? Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as for as for long as heaven and earth last, not the least point, not the smallest detail of the law will be done away with, not until the end of all things. That's a pretty straightforward statement, isn't it? <laughs> and Gordon? Proverbs 28, 9. If you do not obey the law, God will find your prayers too hateful to hear. That's a pretty <laughs> incredible statement, isn't it? Protestant reformers almost universally recognize the importance of God's law. But somehow, most of them did not see the necessity of going all the way to observing the seventh-day Sabbath. However, notice these words from one of, the most, one of the important reformers, the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley. Myra? Yes, from the Bible Study Guide, John Wesley is quoted saying, The ritual or ceremonial law delivered by Moses to the children of Israel containing all of the injunctions and ordinances which related the old sacrifices and service of the temple, our Lord indeed did come to destroy and dissolve and utterly abolish. But the moral law contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away. It was the design of his coming. It was not the design. It was not the design of his coming to revoke any part of this. This is the law which can never be broken, which stands fast as, a fa as the faithful witness in heaven. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind in, and in all ages, as not depending either on time or place or any other circumstance liable to change, but on the nature of God, the nature of man, and their unchangeable relation to each other. That's from wow. the sermon. Sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon right. on the Sermon on the Mount yeah. by John Wesley. Wow. No, Many. Before before we yeah. move forward, um, um, Saint Patrick was a Sabbath keeper. Hmm. Yeah. Google it. Find it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, Council of Trent. Yeah. Well, why did it break up? Um, 1564, somewhere there, when the Catholic, when the, when the uh, Pope f knew that he just cannot beat Martin Luther, it's mm -hmm. spreading like wildfire. Well, let's get the council together. They went on for years yeah. talking about, uh, so about these different uh, issues. Well, the Catholics cannot win. So finally, the Bishop of Reggio, 
stormed in there one day and he says, you look, you guys, we are the ones who change the Sabbath from Saturday worship to Sunday worship. And you are all bowing down to it. Mm -hmm. you, you do not have any biblical basis to keep Sunday holy. We are the ones who did it. You are all renegades. This is done. We're done talking with you. <laughs> that ended it. Wow. You know, so, I mean, there's, there's so much evidence in there. You and I know these things, you know. Yeah. I have a Baptist friend, he's hundreds of uh, members in his church. He says, you know, Charles, it's okay. Any day you can keep. I that's see. what it that's, has come that's, that's to. They, you can yeah. keep any, but they'll still so faithfully. Uh, you, my job you, is to go, let, remind them, you know, that's what you're on my job. Very high percentage of pastors do not believe what they yeah. peddle. That's very, very true. And I'll give you a good text for that. Jeremiah 6.13. The priests and the prophets are motivated by... <laughs> Greed. 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 Yeah. Many more Bible verses seem to support this general principle, this idea that the law includes the Sabbath and we should, we should observe it. Um, where are we? Who's next? Yeah. Go. I just read. Oh, you just read? Oh. Okay. Okay, then it's me. Since the law of God is a transcript of his character, the foundation of his throne and the moral basis for humanity, Satan hates it from our Bible study guide. You know, those that uh, think that the character, God's character is of nothing to be worth No discussing. big deal. No, no. But yet, what is it? And, and yet people are afraid to die. And Jesus says, eternal life is to know the Father. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, have this mind as you, as mm -hmm. is in, in Jesus. In other words, think like Jesus. Uh, what, what's wrong with the, I mean, what, what part of the under, equation don't they understand? Yeah, they, they're not, exactly. you know, they, they've, got, they've got people, oh, no, Jesus came and paid the penalty. You're all paid up, thank the Lord, and, and utter this uh, little phrase, and, and you'll be all, all taken care of. Okay. You want to take on that next okay. quotation? None could fail to see that if the earthly sanctuary was a figure or, or pattern of the heavenly, the law deposited in the ark on the earth was an exact transcript. Excuse me, an exact transcript of the law in the ark in heaven. Uh, excuse me, in heaven, and that an acceptance of the truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary involved an acknowledgement of the heavenly. The claims of God. The claims of God law and obligation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Here was a, the secret of the bitter and determined opposition to the harmon, harmonious exposition of the scriptures that revealed the administration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 435. Yeah. So ultimately the question that comes up is God is going to, is God going to judge is he going to finally bring every one of us to court? No. Nobody wants to know that. Nobody wants to hear that. So why does it seem so hard for people to accept the Ten Commandments as the basis of God's government and to carefully observe the Sabbath? People claim that the Old Testament is no longer applicable to us and that the seven-day Sabbath was an ancient Jewish requirement which does not apply to Christians. They do not want to keep the Sabbath or to acknowledge that one day God's law will be his basis for judgment of the entire world. Hmm. That's kind of ominous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Jennifer? From Ellen G. White. While God has given ample evidence for faith, he will never remove all excuse for unbelief. All who look for hooks to hang their doubts upon will find them. And those who refuse to accept and obey God's word until every objection has been removed and there is no longer an opportunity for doubt will never come to the light. Wow. Yeah. Well, Genesis 2, 1 through 3 and Exodus 28 through 11. I think you remember that Genesis 2 where, is where God creates the Sabbath in the beginning and Exodus 20 is his enshrining that Sabbath on in the Ten Commandments. There, there was, by the way, no Jew when the world was created. No, <laughs> there wasn't. 
these two make it very clear that the basic reason for keeping the Sabbath is because it is a celebration of God's creative activity in the beginning. God created us, and without him we would not exist. Passages like Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20 make it clear that the Sabbath was intended for all time to be a memorial for us to recognize our relationship with the Creator. Having recognized these points, we must turn now to consider <coughs> Satan's response. Okay. Revelation 12, 12, 12, 12 and 12, 17. And so be glad, you heavens and all you that live in there. But how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you and he is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. And the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of, the, of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Christ. Mm. Okay, Gordon. Revelation 13, verse 7 and then verse 4. It, that is the leopard-like beast, was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. Who does that leave out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then verse, verse 4, which actually is chronolo chronologically earlier. Everyone worshipped the dragon, that is the devil, because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? it okay, now here's the huge question for today. What could cause everyone, in quotation marks, to worship the devil? Do they know that they're worshiping the devil? The devil doesn't exist, they say, yeah. or so many of them do. As Since the devil's m main motivation is selfishness, while God's very character is love, which of these two motivations seems to be dominant in the Western world today? All over mm. the world is selfishness. Is this true also in the communist world and the Muslim world? Yes, sir. And we could add others as well. <clears throat> okay. This is Myra? the great controversy. Mrs. White says, but what is the, be the image of the beast and how is it to be formed? The image is made by a two-horned beast and is an image to the beast. Okay. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt again. We've been talking about how important it is to learn about the character of God and the fact that some people have raised questions about the character of God. Who else do we need to learn about? The beast itself. It's the devil. The devil himself and his cohorts. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and the power of God. And in order to control the consequences of the people, the con consciences, conscience, conscience, our conscience, she sought to support the secular power. The result of the was the papacy, the church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church and to establish her own ends. Great Controversy, page 443. Without mentioning any names, I will tell you that one powerful political individual made an announcement today on the news that to raise money for his political campaign, he's selling a special version of the Bible. 
Really? It, we are just, not too far from home. We are going home. Wow. We are going home. Mm-hmm. Oh, that sounds good. Basically, it's a King James Version with the Constitution so, and a few other Declaration of Independence in that. So. But the, the issue is, is that it's becoming a political tool. Right, it is. Well, it, yeah. Anytime you want to control other people, it's political, yeah. by definition. Can you imagine Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, Hindus, everyone else joining together to worship the same the devil? If, if the people can get a cut of the action, they'll be glad to do that, or, well, or get, get, get the, be able to suck on the public tit. The, the question is this. Are we going to end up being loving people, looking after the interests of others, or are we going to be selfish? And I think the, the world is becoming so selfish everywhere that, I mean, we're way down the road. It's, it's, it's no turning back. I mean, yeah. I don't think you, how you can unravel it. We know that the section of, of Revelation 12 through 14 is the central core of the book of Revelation. Revelation 12 outlines the great controversy from beginning to end. Revelation 13 tells us what the devil is going to do. And Revelation 14 tells us God's response. It still seems unbelievable that the whole world could wander after the beast and worship the devil. So Ellen White makes these additional comments. When the leading churches of the United States, she's getting pretty specific here, mm -hmm. uniting one upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon, the, upon dissenters will inevitably result. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Could that happen to us? If I may, there's something called COP28 that just happened in mm -hmm. uh, Dubai mm -hmm. in, uh, on December the 2nd. Uh, of this year, of last, last year, year, last year, 80,000 people from all over the world were there. And there was a huge area that was called Pavilion of Faith. Mm. And who is to go and speak there on ecumenism? The Pope himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, are, we are living in very exciting times of the world's history. We're going yep. home. And what is God's summary response? Jim, I think that's yours. Okay. These are our important voices. This you shouldn't even have to read it. You can just... This is key, key text, isn't it? Yes. Revelation 14, <laughs> verses 6 to 12. Then I saw another angel flying in high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness. For the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Second angel followed. The first one. She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She has made all peoples drink of her wine, the strong drink of her immoral lust. Verse 9. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and his image and receives the mark in, on their forehead or in their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, when he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in the fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image for anyone who has the mark of its name. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commands and are faithful to Jesus. Now, unfortunately, we're reading God's response without really focusing on devil's first challenges. 
in Revelation 13, the chapter before this, he says, first of all, anybody who doesn't accept my mark, he's going to be killed. Just this, so many words. That's what he, the devil says. That's what the devil says. And then he says, not only that, even they won't even be able to buy or sell. And two, two places there in that chapter, it is they worshipped or wondered after the beast. Yep. They, they, they admired it. Mm -hmm. They liked control. Yeah. So, remember that the term God's fury, wrath, or anger are simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who persistently and consistently indicate that they do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. And there's more coming up on that in just a moment. Many people think that it is unlike God, whose character is love, to treat the wicked as is suggested by the third angel's message. But if God were to take the wicked to heaven, they would be ex expected to act always in love, which is God's universal principle. For them, heaven would be torture. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, is that possible? <laughs> Let's see. What uh, Ellen G. White says in The Great Controversy, a life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace <laughs> would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The wow. destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Mm. So, so is God doing everything he can to get each of us into heaven? Absolutely. Yeah. He really is. And with the exception of these people, he, he's not going to take anybody to heaven where, for whom it would be, it would be hell. Didn't Ellen White say somewhere, if there was only one who, yeah. who fell, the Lord would have come? Yeah. Said that one. Hmm. Okay, the same is true for the devil, even more so, since he can remember what it was like in heaven when he was Lucifer. Mm -hmm. If you look at, want to look up the Great Controversy, page 670, uh, paragraphs 1 and 2. Um, she says, for the devil, it would be supreme torture. Wow. And what will be the final conclusion of all that? It will be the seven last plagues as spelled out in Revelation 15 and 16. We don't have time to look at all those, but let's just touch them very quickly. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. Who will not stand in awe of you, Lord? Who will refuse to declare your greatness? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you because you just actions, because of your just actions and sin by all. Good news, Bible. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. Terrible and painful sores appeared on those who had the mark of the beast and on those who had worshipped its image. Okay. You want to jump in there, Gordon? Revelation 19, verse 20. The beast was taken prisoner together with the false prophet who had performed miracles in his presence. And in parentheses in the Bible, it was by those miracles that he had deceived those who had the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image of the beast. Okay, let's interrupt there for just a second. Can Satan perform miracles? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's going to be one of his main ways of deceiving people in the end. But if he doesn't exist, yeah. it must be God. Who that's did right. It. Oh, good point. Yeah. yeah. Continuing Revelation 19, the beast and the false prophet were mm -hmm. both thrown in alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Good news Bible. And Myra. This is from the Great Controversy. In mercy to the world, God blotted out its wicked inhabitants in Noah's time. In mercy, he destroyed 
he destroyed the corrupt dwellers of Sodom. Through the deceptive power of Satan, the workers of iniquity obtain sympathy and admiration and are thus constantly leading others to rebellion. It was so in Cain's and in Noah's day and in the time of Abraham and Lot mm -hmm. and, so in our, uh, and so in our time. It is in mercy to the universe that God will finally destroy the rejectors of His grace. So who are we going to worship? Do we really want to be in an environment ruled by God where everyone is loving and kind and consider of others? Or do we want to take the natural, human, sinful, selfish approach and join Satan's side? Well, if you're going to have that, then you're going to have to have a hierarchy, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And there's no love in that. Note the contrast. This is from our Bible study guide. Either people worship the Creator or they worship something else. The Creator is worthy of worship, Revelation 5, 9. The controversy between Christ and Satan began in heaven over worship. Quote, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, Satan claims. Satan wanted the worship belonging only to the Creator. According to Revelation 13, he succeeds through the activity of the land beast, Revelation 13, 4, that we read a few moments ago. So what happens to people who hold the dragon and the beast in highest regard? It is a law, both of the intellectual, this is Ellen White's words, it is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than the standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. So if we're looking at Jesus and following his example every day, which direction are we going? Up. If we're following the devil every day, practicing his selfish ways, where are we going? Down. Well, we don't have time to look at Daniel 7, but it talks about the judgment there in Daniel 7. See if you can see how it compares with what we have read in Revelation 12 and 13. Again, the same story. See, especially Daniel 7.25. We'll take a moment to look at that. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And who is that we're talking about? Satan. Yeah. And Revelation 13, 5, it's coming up here in a moment. In Daniel 7, we are told that this beast will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people and try to change religious laws and festivals. We already looked at Daniel 7, 25. Let's look at Revelation 13, 5. The beast was allowed to make proud claims which were insulting to God. That's another word for blasphemy. And it was permitted to have authority for 42 months or three and a half years. Our Bible study guide again. Where are we? Me? That's Jim. For an earthly power to seek to change the day of worship, the seventh day Sabbath, which God Himself gave as a sign of His authority, Exodus 31 13 and Ezekiel 20 verses 12 and 20, is an attempt to usurp divine authority at the most basic level possible. On this point, then, is the focus of the final conflict over true and false worship from the Bible study guide. Okay, Revelation 14, 7 to 12, which we've already read, is God's response to the devil's threats. The second angel again declares, Babylon has fallen, has fallen the great city because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of, of her fornication. And we're going to slide down here a little bit because we're running out of time. We know that in the end, Protestant groups are going to join Catholic groups and the, the whole world, somehow or other, are going to come together and they're going to, to, to repeat what we said earlier, everybody's going to be, except for the faithful few, are going to be worshiping who? 
devil. The devil. But God will have an end time people who are loyal to him. They will face the greatest opposition and the fiercest persecution in the history of our world. Amen. Jennifer? From Ellen G. White, in the absence of Bible testimony in their favor, many with unwearying persistence urged, forgetting how the same reasoning had been employed against Christ and his apostles. Quote, why do not, why do not our great men understand the Sabbath question? But few believe as you do. It cannot be that you are right and that all the men of learning in the world are wrong. Mm -hmm. To refute such arguments, it was needful only to cite the teachings of the scriptures and the history of the Lord's dealings with his people in all ages. From the Great Controversy. Charles? Christians of past generations observed the Sunday, supposing that in so doing, they were keeping the Bible Sabbath. And there are now true Christians in every church not accepting, accepting the Roman Catholic communion uh, who honestly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath of divine appointment. God accepts their sincerity of purpose and their integrity before Him. But when Sunday observance will be enforced by law and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligations of the true Sabbath, then whoever shall transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority than that of Rome will therefore on, thereby honor uh, popery above God. He is paying uh, homage to Rome and to the power and enforces the institution obtained by Rome. He is worshiped the beast and his image as men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority and honor it instead of that which Rome has chosen as the token of his supremacy, of our supremacy, they will thereby accept the signs of allegiance to Rome, the mark of the beast. And it is not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men that those who continue to transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Okay, we're running out of time. There are lots of questions that should have come up in your mind as we've talked about all these things. And throughout history, Christians have found reasons and ways not only to diminish the importance of the law of God, but turn away from it. Think about all these things. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we've come today to read some pretty stark and important comments from inspired sources. May we understand what's implied so that we may not be found on the wrong side is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.